All right, everyone, welcome back to our fourth event in our ongoing teamwork seminar series. Uh, my name is Bijou Parakadin. Uh, with us is another co-lead from the Team Science Core at NJX, Nancy Reichman. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone, this is a bi-monthly university-wide seminar series hosted by the Team Science Core of NJX. And uh, we've uh, been continuing to bring experts from a range of institutions outside of academia to educate uh, our faculty on some key concepts of teamwork that have been learned and experienced um, you know, outside of, of the university walls. Uh, today, we're really excited to um, uh, introduce and learn from a major uh, architecture, uh, architectural firm. And uh, the title today for our seminar is uh, Lessons from an Iconic International Architecture Firm. We have with us here from Perkin, Perkins Eastman Architects, uh, Brad Perkins, uh, who's the founder and chairman. Uh, Nick Leahy is the co-CEO and executive director. And Rachel Birnbaum is an associate principal and senior project manager. Thank you all for joining and the floor is yours. We can't wait to hear about your lessons learned. Uh, <clears throat> we're very pleased to be able to uh, participate in this program. And uh, we thought it would be helpful just to give a brief introduction to our firm, uh, just to give a sense of the sort of things that we do. And then we'd like to give three case studies, uh, one for each, you know, each of us will talk about a specific project that we are working on and, and why uh, each of them illustrate the issue of why teamwork is so important. And then uh, we've been given five questions to address and uh, each of us will respond on each of those five questions. Okay, thanks. Our firm, uh, we have been focused primarily on projects uh, where what happens inside our buildings is really the most important thing. And uh, so our whole design process is built around the people who are going to use our buildings, they're gonna live there or work or play, learn, age or heal within the environments we plan and design. So, you know, we'd like to say that our core uh, ethos of the firm is human by design. Uh, we are a firm with uh, 22 offices around the world, um, uh, <clears throat> 18 of them in North America and, and uh, then one in South America, one in the Middle East, one in India, and one in China. And we're not a generalist firm, uh, but as, as a large firm uh, with 1,100 employees, uh, we are built around 14, well, it's a, you know, I mean, 15 specialized practice areas uh, where we try and bring real expertise to uh, specific types of projects. Uh, and just to give a brief illustration, uh, it will come back to this project, but probably our best known project is our smallest one, which is the DKTS booth in the middle of Times Square. Uh, we also do a wide variety of cultural projects, including the Tenement Museum in the Lower East Side. Um, we do lots of schools and other projects for uh, children. This happens to be a charter school in Harlem. But we do schools all over the world and across the US. This happens to be uh, the Wuhan International Education Center in China. Uh, and we also do lots of colleges and universities. This is a uh, computational uh, sciences building at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and again, we work around the world. This is university that I'm currently working on, uh, which is a new university campus in outside of Delhi, uh, Shoka University. We do public buildings, including courthouses. Uh, uh, one of our first big courthouses was the Queen's Civil Court. Uh, and we do uh, healthcare. This is, we've been rebuilding Stanford uh, University Medical Center's main hospital for the last 10 years. And we again do hospitals around the world. This is 
the first comprehensive cancer center, uh, which is in Petatikva, which is outside Tel Aviv in, in Israel. And we do large mixed use commercial developments. This is the largest private development in the District of Columbia uh, called the District Wharf, uh, where we have been the master architect. Uh, there have been many other architects involved, but uh, the architect that conceived the project and uh, we've done six of the buildings in most of the public areas of, of this project. Uh, <clears throat> this, this has been a very successful destination. It's where the Anacostia River meets the Potomac. We do lots of residential. The tall building in the middle is 99 Hudson, which is uh, uh, has the distinction of being the tallest building in New Jersey. It's for one of our Chinese clients. Uh, it's a residential tower of 80 stories across from uh, Wall Street. And again, we work around the world. Uh, one of Nick's projects, uh, which is the headquarters of the Guangzhou Metro system. Uh, it's a mixed use development in uh, Guangzhou, Southern China. Uh, <clears throat> we also have a large specialty in designing facilities for uh, seniors. Uh, this happens to be the Harvard affiliated retirement community in the Boston area. But again, we work around the world. This is uh, one of a number of projects uh, that we've done uh, for seniors in uh, Japan. It uh, happens to be in Tokyo. And a lot of this is built on our ability to start before its architecture and do large scale uh, mixed use planning uh, in Guayaquil, Ecuador, the, where we have an office. They're moving the main international airport out of the center of the city. and. We were hired as planners to replan this as a new central district for this city of uh, almost 4 million people. And uh, we do other planning, of course, all around the world. Uh, for two and a half years, uh, we, I served as the chief planner for the city of Hanoi, capital of Vietnam, and uh, uh, to do a comprehensive master plan for the 3,300 square kilometer capital of that country. And we also have a very long uh, successful relationship with Rutgers uh, and uh, done a wide variety of projects. Uh, our first completed project was the School of Nursing and Sciences in Camden. Uh, uh, we just completed the Honors Dorm in uh, Newark. And we have done a variety of uh, facilities uh, for the sports programs. Uh, this happens to be the football practice complex. And <clears throat> we did uh, for the Athletic Performance Center, which is really the basketball training center, uh, but it also includes our W.J. Barnabas uh, Health uh, facility uh, on the main campus. And with that introduction, we'd like to just give you three quick case studies as to why uh, architecture you know, is a team sport. Uh, I will do one and Rachel will do one and Nick will do one. Um, I'm, I'll start with the largest of the three. Uh, this and the white building there in the center is a uh, was just completed about a year and a half ago. It's uh, the most advanced ambulatory care setting for cancer care in the world. It's uh, for Memorial Sloan Kettering. It's three quarters of a million square feet, a billion dollar project uh, that has all the most advanced treatments uh, uh, in an outpatient setting for, for cancer. Uh, and the, you know, and we'll come back to this, uh, the thought that one person could conceive the vast variety of knowledge and, and detail that a project like this has is, you know, inconceivable. So uh, let's just go through 
this is just give you because not only were we doing a box that all this would happen in, but we were designing every single thing in the interior. <laughs> this is uh, this is the uh, cafe that is part of the complex. Uh, this is a typical exam room. This, uh, there are some inpatient beds here, although it's primarily an outpatient facility. Uh, again, other you know, spaces for team meetings and things. And then a lot of advanced modalities in terms of the, uh, for the diagnosis and, and treatment of cancer. So to do a project like this requires an extremely large team. This team was led by uh, the two founders of this firm, uh, led by Mary Jean Eastman and by me. Uh, we had a principal level project manager who had several assistant project managers. We had a principal leading the medical planning with support staff and the principal leading the interior architecture uh, somebody leading the exterior enclosure, and uh, some <clears throat> another principal leading the interior design, and then several principal level people leading all the technical documentation and and, and monitoring the project during construction. Uh, <clears throat> we had a team of twenty five to thirty people generally on this project, but in addition, we in order to do this project, you know, we had uh, over 30 specialized consultants, all of whom were essential to the design. We had mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, plumbing engineers, fire protection engineers, structural engineers, security consultants, lighting consultants, uh, civil engineers, landscape architects, and exterior enclosure advisors. And then we had other special, those are just the basic ones you need. And then there are specialty consultants for parking, acoustics, shielding, audiovisual, sled protection, materials handling, vertical transportation, food service, experiential design and signage among others. And, uh, and we were just the design team, but there were equally important was the construction an equipment and fit out team, which was led by Turner Construction. And they had 50 subcontractors. And all of these people are important to the success of a project. This is not something that one person can deal with all of the thousands and thousands of decisions in order to pull off of successful project, which has won many design awards now and is viewed as a model for <clears throat> the delivery of cancer care in an outpatient setting, is not something that is done by an individual. Rachel? So this is um, an image from the New York City Health and Hospitals COVID Centers of Excellence. Um, health and Hospitals is the public health of New York City. Um, they were charged, if you go to the next slide, um, they were charged by the mayor at the beginning of the pandemic to fit out three sites for emergency outpatient facilities for post-COVID recovery care. Um, it was about 100,000 square feet over three sites. And as you can see here, it was a uh, promise to the city that these would be delivered, meaning designed and built uh, within six to nine months. Next slide. So the team was a, a significant and critical part to the success of this project. Um, what you see on the screen now are, are the, the key day-to-day -day Perkins Eastman team players, um, all had very specific roles and some were specific just to one of the three sites, others overlapped all three sites because these were all happening concurrently. So at any given time, we had a minimum of 27 people on the team. Go to the next slide. And then 
also from the Perkins Eastman team, we had another 17 or so that jumped in and out at various times through the project. So we could have, have up to 40 people working on this team at any given time. Um, it was 24 seven um, because it was an emergency response. If you wanna go to the next one, emergency response um, expedited schedule. So the team was structured a little bit, um, the, the structure of the team was significant that there was design leadership and management leadership and technical leadership all happening uh, in alignment with each other, both on our teams and on the client and contractor teams. Um, so this is just an example of how we ideally structure our team internally so that every aspect of the project um, is, is represented at every level through the team. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the org chart of the team at large. So we had the sponsor agency, which was Health and Hospitals and their, their operators, which was Gotham Health, uh, teamed with the managing agency, which was basically the, the city De department of design and construction. We were hired under the, the sponsor agency. There was also the landlords for each of the three facilities and then the construction manager and all of their subcontractors were hired under the managing agency. Next slide. Oh, I think this one is the same part. Um, so essentially the whole team had, we had the three major players all integrated together, working hand in hand, communicating 24 seven in order to make this project successful in the timeline that was required. And you'll see all the branches of all of the subconsultants, all of the, the support functions under the owner team, all of the support under the builders. Um, in addition to this, we had all of the agencies, the New York City agencies involved, um, the Department of Health, New York State Department of Health and the building department and the fire department and everyone jumped in. And I mean, the team sport is an understatement in this project. So the schedule, as I mentioned, was we started design in March, April, 2020. And as you'll see, the contract, the construction manager came on board at the same time. So from the beginning, we were working hand in hand with the construction manager, the design team, the owner and the managing agency, every decision, every move had to happen intimately throughout the course of the project in order to deliver the, the Bronx site we delivered in September, Queens in November and Brooklyn in December. Next slide. And just a couple of snapshots from each of the, site, each of the sites. So the Bronx site here uh, was the, the renovation of the first floor space, which is about 25,000 square feet. Um, you'll see some of the progress shots during construction and then some of the finished images on the, on the right side, all um, ambulatory care, um, exam rooms, x-ray, um, diagnostics, and waiting spaces and sub waiting spaces and all three sites had the same level of consistency, which was critical. Um, and the team working together and understanding their roles and how they, they overlap and talk to each other over the course of these projects was, was unbelievable. Next slide. Same thing for the Queen site. We had the second floor of this multifamily building, um, progress shots and you see the final shots on the right. Again, same program over the three projects and the Brooklyn site was the entire building. Um, you can see in the middle there circled in red, them lifting the air handling unit onto the roof of the existing building. All of this happened within nine months from design through construction. Okay, I will talk about our smallest project that probably took the longest to build. <laughs> um, so everybody, well, maybe you don't, but the TKTS in, in, in uh, Times Square, it really became a landmark uh, when it was determined that, um, you know, it's how do you get from landmark to landmark, basically, uh, and the journey we went through that, um, especially a beloved landmark like the, the booth and the banners were. Um, there was a competition held in, in 1999 for a new booth. It was won by two students from Australia. Uh, they had a terrific idea of creating a viewing platform that they understood Times Square is a kind of amazing room and there was nowhere to sit and watch it from. And so they started and developed um, this design. They were selected in February of 2000 
uh, and they started working on the project. Um, this was their image, uh, which I think was the most compelling image of the package. They uh, worked together and then for whatever reason, around about 2001, the project sort of hit a uh, stopping point. And we were engaged in July of 2001 to do a feasibility study. Um, the booth had been around since 1973. Um, it was literally two construction trailers, cost $5,000 and took four days to put up and had been up for a considerable amount of time. They wanted a new booth. So we did a feasibility study. We analyzed this and we said, well, you know, what is it about this idea that everybody found so compelling? Um, and how would we go about designing it so that it would become a reality? So we sort of said, well, what is, what is this? And we said, it's really the experience of a floating carpet. You're sitting in the middle of this crazy visual spectacle. Uh, you have a booth, which is something that should be prefabricated. It needs an engine, a mechanical system, and it really should be a showcase of technology and design. Times Square has always been an aspirational place, a place that people came to um, to showcase technology. So this is um, how it kind of got there. So we designed an all glass structure. We prefabricated a booth and we made sure that we could um, use all prefabricated systems uh, in order to generate uh, the energy that was needed on an island at the crossroads of the world. Um, so that really what that equaled was a series of very, very complex uh, fabrications and interactions, uh, which involved people from Austria, Scotland, Rhode Island, California, uh, all coming together to make this object. Um, this is just a sort of summary of, of the features of that. Uh, and then I just wanted to go through a bit of the chronology. Um, so the competition started on the left-hand side uh, the, the dots are sort of key moments where um, teams are hired or, team, or there's a moment where there's a shift. So February 2000, Choi Ropia is selected. Uh, project goes on hold at some point. July 2001, Perkins Eastman's uh, a new team's brought on board. Um, and and in, in January 2002, after our feasibility study is, is put in place, um, we, are, we are engaged to sort of flesh that out. 2003, we assemble a team of people from around the world who are experts in glass engineering. Um, we move on through until a, a construction manager has joined the team. And he is now sort of the reality is moving forward of how do we get the whole team that's going to build this project together. Uh, 2005, December, it's awarded to a Scottish uh, company that's been around for hundreds of years um, to do the glass. And we start in 2006 building, moving all the way through. Um, so it, we're adding to the team, it's expanding all the time. February, April, the full team is working full tilt on shop drawings, fabrication schedules, all that kind of stuff till February the 14th, 2007, when Har and Glass, a company that's been around for 150 years, goes into receivership and bankruptcy. So the whole kind of house of cards falls down and we have to pick that back up again. In April of that year, we've reassembled the team and we're back on the road and we're moving all the way through until installation is finished in 2008. So small project like this takes close to 10 years and a huge, um, a huge uh, number of people. Just to give you a sense of the team, uh, this isn't as large as the team that Brad or Rachel was working on, but it's pretty close. Uh, we had three clients, a uh, member of understanding between the Theatre Development Fund, the Times Square Alliance, and the Coalition for Father Duffy. There was an owner's representation um, that was a kind of making sure the owner's interests were attended to. Then there was really a core design team, which is ourselves, Perkins Eastman. And then you can see the list, the list on the left-hand side going from structural glass engineer all the way down to expediters. 
uh, and then a build team, the construction side of it, the construction manager. And the integration between actually the design and build team had to be hugely important. Most of what we were doing, it was innovative, never been done before kind of stuff. Um, so the engineering team on the build side and the engineering team on our design side had to be locked step. And then if you go across, I've organized it in terms of what went into the booth, what went into the site, the engineering, and so on and so on. And then there's the city team, because this was actually a great collaboration in a way between private funding, not-for-profits, and the city. And you really, in New York City, probably one of the most complex places to build, you have to have a team approach. Um, and all of those agencies and many more were involved. Rachel mentioned her agencies. And then you also have to engage officials like mayors. Uh, you saw that Bill de Blasio had issued about the, the COVID centers. And M Michael Bloomberg was key and, and Christine Quinn in pushing this project forward. But it was done on a, on a, on a um, team approach. I put in some slides about collaboration, which I think are really important. This is from an architect, Ian Ritchie, who wrote an article in 1995 about redefining the design team, which shifts it away from what people think of the individual genius. Um, and I, I, I've always felt these are very uh, perceptive um, comments about how anybody has to work in a team and collaborate, no matter what you do. Um, I'll not read them out, but I think um, it's really about having a common aim, mutual trust and respect, listening, being prepared to be interrupted. Um, but really it comes down to how do we bring our talents together as a team to make something bigger? Um, so that, that's some, something. And then um, Ovarup uh, built an amazing design firm, engineering firm called Arab Associates, this is a quote about collaboration from 1972. Um, I think it's still um, very pertinent. I think collaboration is something that's the hardest thing for people to do, the easiest thing for people to throw around, because you basically have to give yourself to something bigger than yourself. But personally, and I think Brad and anybody at Perkins Eastman would say that the rewards far outstrip the sort of uh, effort that goes into it. So that's kind of, I think, where we were at, right? Yep. So, um, so you can stop sharing or. So I think we can talk, uh, we were given five questions. Um, I don't know whether you want to prompt the questions? Yeah, um, I, I, I just want to, A, you know, commend uh, your team for just fantastic work. Those, uh, you know, pictures were just gorgeous. I can't believe uh, all of that is accomplished by one group. Um, the scale and the timelines of these projects are also, um, you know, really unique compared to some of our other institutions that have been talking about teamwork. And so, uh, the first question is really about, uh, you know, maybe not losing the trees when building these forests and how to incentivize your team members, uh, especially when you're working in such large groups um, and, uh, and, and potentially long timeframes or, or you know, very emergent timeframes. How, how do you keep everyone um, excited about the big goal, but also still personally, um, you know, ambitious to grow and, and you know move their careers forward at, at Perkins Eastman. There's a disconnect between what we're taught in school and what actually happens in real life. Uh, in many or most of the architectural schools, there is still this perpetuation of a myth that great architecture is the product of a genius who uh, conceives the project almost in whole and uh, and then it somehow uh, you know gets implemented by a bunch of you know uh, support troops and, and that's been perpetuated by also some of the leading figures in our profession and also by you know movies I mean if you see an architect in the movies he's almost always practicing as an individual I think the extreme case, 
is uh, based on the book, The Fountainhead. Uh, it has Gary Cooper, you know, as this lone genius who, whatever. And uh, it's all a myth. Uh, as we tried to illustrate with these three case studies, architecture is a team sport. And it's, uh, and, you know, what really motivates most architects is, uh, is what comes out at the end of the day. It, you, we have something tangible, you know, if, it, if it's successful, we have something that you can touch and point to and say, you know, I helped make that happen. And that really does motivate most of the people. Uh, what's been a very unfortunate and counterproductive in our field is that the fact that it's a team sport is not uh, has not been properly recognized, and that has been counterproductive in terms of uh, uh, of rewarding all the incredible talent it takes to produce projects like the ones we just showed. Uh, you know, even though the film industry has its own problems, one of the things that we should have learned from the film industry, which has the in order to make a successful movie, and I have a lot of family in that business as well. Uh, again, it takes an incredible array of talents, but at least the film industry recognizes and rewards with Academy Awards and others, the, all the varied talents that it takes to produce a great film, you know, from actors and producers and directors and screenwriters and art directors and lighting and music and everything else that unfortunately is not yet true in the design professions and so uh but thank goodness you know people go into these professions because the real motivation is getting to an end product that you can say for the rest of your life you know i was involved in doing that and uh it's uh we have a long way to go, um, but uh, we think, you know, that motivation will continue to keep people coming to the profession. Nick, you want to say, or Rachel? Um, so I, I actually think it's a lot about the process as well, not just taking pride in the in the product. Um, I think when roles are clearly defined on a team, and people are given ownership of their part of the project and their role in, in producing something and executing something that can come to life um, at the end of the job. I think that that camaraderie and, um, and relationship building within the project team is really critical to the success of the project because quite frankly, we spend many, many hours together. Um, mm -hmm. Years, yeah. years, many, many years together. <laughs> and if we can't work together and don't have each other's backs and rely on each other and and um, trust each other, then it's impossible to to come to that successful outcome. And I think that that's what helps us get through the more trying times or the the changes or the the ups and downs is knowing that we're we're doing it together. So we'll we'll succeed together and we'll fail together, and it just it just adds value and 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 fun. Yeah, I think um, motivating is, as Brad said, you come out of school and you're motivated by being able to make stuff. Um, when you join a team, if you if you have a great team and good leadership, they will bring growth out of you, and then playing off of each other. So I think it's the camaraderie, respect, trust, but also the opportunity to, to uh, contribute. And that comes from having alignment over what the common aim of the project is. And so that you can, um, unfortunately, because of the way we're trained, probably it's not about my taking ownership over the ideas. It's about saying like, I contributed to that idea and that idea really came from the collaboration or the creative flow that happens between people. So I think that's how you motivate people um, and recognizing it. I mean, they have to be recognized. Uh, 
Yeah. And we have incredibly talented people for that. So we're lucky. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great segue uh, to dealing with talent, but sometimes, especially in these large groups, uh, perhaps you've you know, encountered uh, maybe more of a miscreant, someone who you know, may be effective or may not be effective, but uh, <laughs> everyone's looking around. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but how, do you, how do you manage folks that uh, you know, are ineffective or not working well uh, within your group settings? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a real issue in our, in our profession. I mean, uh, architect, some of the most famous architects are, or have been infamous for their egos. Uh, and, uh, and some of them are extremely difficult to work with. Uh, but as is the case with many professional service firms, uh, if you are the person who has the client relationship, it gives you a strong say in how things go forward. Uh, and we do have that problem at times. We have, uh, and we even have one or two cases today where we have uh, senior leaders who we have to buffer uh, usually with very strong teams who are able to manage these very large egos. Uh, <laughs> but there are there have been times over the course of the growth of our firm um, over the last 40 years that uh, even when we try and buffer them with you know strong people around them who can deal with them, um, it isn't working. And uh, we've had to part ways. We have, if you'll pardon the phrase, we have a, an aspirational goal of that we have no assholes. And, uh, and, and it's hard to implement if they also happen to be the source of some of the projects we want to work on. But over time, we have generally able to achieve that. But when we have somebody with a great deal of talent who uh, can be managed, uh, we have to surround them with very strong people who are able to do that because even they need a team. And so it's finding a team that can control it. Rachel? And nobody wants to work in a toxic environment. So I think it's the responsibility of, of leadership to, um, to listen to any issues that come up, um, to, to pay attention to the cues of when things aren't working um, and to address them. Because if we're just listening and not doing anything about it, the problem isn't gonna go away. We're just adding to the problem. So that, I mean, the, the outcome of that ha takes different forms, whether it's a, a separation, whether it's teaming different people together um, to find the right relationships because different people work differently with different people, right? So um, I don't think that a, there's a one size fits all solution, but unless we are actively involved in remedying toxic situations, we're part of the problem. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would sort of, uh, I think that's you know, very perceptive. I think uh, when you're managing teams or leading teams, listening is probably the most important part, but then sort of identifying ways to uh, make sure the team is, is, is working effectively. So if you have someone with toxic, you know, there, as Brad said, there are certain times when you run into that. Um, you should never sort of just shy away from it. Um, you, 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 you may build a team around them to sort of buffer them, but we've, we've tried that approach. But the ideal is that uh, they are kind of, they grow into the team in a way. And that takes a lot of work on the leadership's part, uh, constant communication, uh, constant sort of um, monitoring of what's going on. But, 
ideally, you know, you try to get the team to to operate for one each other, you know, support one one another rather than uh, you don't want to ever get in a situation where there's a somebody leading the team and everybody else is serving them. That just doesn't work. But I've worked at places that where where that's happened and people just become uh, they just regret working. It becomes like that's the worst place ever. So. Well, I can imagine that uh, you know within your institution as well as the numerous touch points that you have with uh, you know external contractors and, and construction groups. Uh, there's a lot of transitions that must happen with new personnel coming into either your group organization or just interfacing with new teams. Uh, and in the same way, even uh, you know, exiting uh, relationships, hopefully in a graceful and healthy way. Uh, any lessons learned uh, where you know, bringing on new team members or either within or you know, externally uh, that you've found to be effective uh, in you know, preparing, planning, and, and making for really smooth segues uh, to you know, expanding your group or contracting it? Well, in most, most projects, there's a core team. It, not all firms are organized the same way, but, but the way we're organized is fairly typical of, of large firms. Uh, which is there's a core team of just a few people who will be with the project all the way through from the initial planning through the various stages as the project is designed and it's documented to get it ready for construction and then just see it through during the construction phase so that the design intent is carried out. Um, so we're used and the team that core team is actually relatively small, even for a big project at the very beginning, uh, but it grows uh, steadily. And as, as the design work and the documentation gets more detailed, there are more and more specialists added. Uh, there's more and more staff added. Uh, and so we're used to having a teams that grow. And then uh, when it's documented, ready for construction, it begins to contract again. And what keeps the team focused and centered is that core leadership group that uh, carries through all the phases. But we're used to having teams build up and then, you know, then shrink back down. Uh, but what keeps the team integrity is, is that core leadership team. I think that it's important that people are very clear on their roles and responsibilities on a team, because depending on the nature of the project, like the one that I presented earlier, um, there are ebbs and flows throughout the entire course of a project. Another team may need support. People need to come off. People need to come on. If you are defining repeatedly defining people's roles and confirming people's roles and giving them ownership of those components and um, keeping the communication open, the dialogue open and treating everyone with a mutual trust and respect. It makes it much easier to onboard or lose team members because um, there's essentially a team built around anyone who comes in new or leaves. And and people understand where they need to pick up someone else's slack or let go of something else because they know exactly how to work as a team, um, which I think is, is important not just to define at the beginning of a project, but to continually reinforce and um, modify as necessary throughout the course of a project. Yeah, I would back onto that a bit. The idea is the common aim, right? People need to know their role, but they also know to know how their contribution fits to the bigger thing. When that disconnect happens is when they start to wonder. But, and they, they also have to be appreciated for their contribution. So it's, it's kind of a, it's this common thing. And it's sometimes hard, honestly, to, to get that because you can get characters that come in who just sort of like want to blow everything up. But, you know, but that's, Part of the fun of it as well, to be honest, all the different kind of people that you get to work with. So, sometimes, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it strikes me that communication is 
absolutely critical um, for for your firm to have thrived uh, for so many decades. Uh, can you speak a little bit about um, you know, any unique ways you uh, communicate with each other or any structures that have been really effective? Uh, and along that same line too, if you know problems or conflicts um, do arise, how do you um, uh, you know work through them uh, you know in a communicative way? Well, uh, this is obviously a period where it, that has stretched our ability to communicate. Uh, we have had projects where seven offices are working together in the past, but now, you know, during you know the times when virtually everybody was working remotely, we had, you know, thank God for the technology that uh, permits people. Uh, to communicate and we most firms work pretty hard on on their communications skills um, but uh, you know we are most of us are brought up that you know we're working side by side with the people on our team uh, the last you know 18 19 months have tested it and you know because the technology was there uh, you know, we've gotten through this period. I mean, if this recent period had happened, uh, if the pandemic had happened 10 years ago, uh, I'm not quite sure how we would have actually been able to work. Uh, but uh, it's there and we, we have. It's, uh, uh, and it, you know, like so many other things, it does require the core, that core team that I described that carries through the project it does depend upon the skills of that team. Um, and, um, uh, and so if, you know, if there are conflicts that, that, that team, none of us particularly like dealing with conflict, but you learn fairly early on that if you don't deal with it, it just gets worse. So, uh, and, and some of us uh, are better at it than others. I, I would rank myself in the lower quartile of, of, of dealing with conflict. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> Second man. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Rachel? <laughs> um, I think that active listening is a key to effective communication. And by that, I mean, um, we have a tendency to, to put our own filters on whatever we hear someone else saying to us. Um, you know, we're automatically judging or, or reacting based on our perception or our preconceived notions without actually hearing what that person is saying and understanding the message of what they're trying to convey. And if we can take those filters away and look at things objectively and pause and listen instead of reacting, um, it gives us a chance to process a response that can be more beneficial to the communication than if we had just, you know, gotten defensive and reacted, which usually just escalates any conflict. Um, I think the other thing that's key is letting people know that it's okay to make mistakes and creating an environment where we use that as teaching opportunities instead of as a scolding. Um, and that we, I mean, most often people want to learn how to do things right. So if we point out what went wrong, how it went wrong and how to do it differently next time, I think that there's value in, in that level of communication and that value of um, um, feedback that is sometimes frowned upon because it comes off as as negative, but it can be really effective to help people grow. Yeah, I mean, well, I would say one of the things that's probably unique about Perkins is more great is it has, I don't know how many different nationalities that work here. So often you'll be on a team where people come with all sorts of different perspectives, which is fantastic. It also is difficult. What you have to remember is I don't know where I picked it up, but I always say communication happens at the ear of the listener. 
that means like you may communicate something, but you always have to be aware that how they're receiving it is, as Rachel said, depends on so many different factors. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, and, and if you have that in mind, and, and, and the other thing I say is, you know, we'll be working on projects. So we'll do work in China, which means we coordinate with Chinese office. But the team on this end may be coming from all sorts of places, Spain, Japan, Italy, whatever. And they're communicating in English and Chinese to whatever. And the magic is when it happens, right? But there's a lot of work understanding how to communicate that. And I think it's just being aware about communication. And, and then when conflicts happen, address them quickly, but also try to get to the bottom of what the conflict is, because often what it is is something totally misunderstood. Great lessons learned. Um, so uh, we're on for closing remarks. Uh, you know, anyone want to share uh, openly any of the, the great challenges that you must have all encountered, um, you know, in leading, uh, you know, individual efforts or, or any, you know, personal mantras you might have when it comes to teamwork and leadership? Well, one of the things I always like to quote was my, my last roommate uh, in college, uh, uh, a guy named Ken Dryden, who uh, went on to be a Hall of Fame ice hockey player uh, as a goalie for the Montreal Canadiens and uh, won six Stanley Cups in nine years. Uh, he's written a series of books, but his first book, which was a national bestseller, uh, uh, was called The, the Game. And it basically, it was the story of what does it take to create a great dynasty uh, team uh, and and my favorite quote from that book was he quoted his coach scotty bowman that um it, when scotty bowman was uh asked what was his most important job he said it's to put the right six players on the ice at the right time and that in many ways is what nick and rachel and i have to do day to day rachel I think the the key for me is about building trust, and I think and earning trust. Um, it works in both directions, um, just like everything we've been talking about. It's part of teamwork. Um, if that trust isn't there, where you give people enough flexibility to maneuver, because you know they're going to work, you know, in the in the right direction. We're all working in the same direction, and and also earning trust from your end, you know, for them to come and rely on you as, as a leader, as a manager, if that isn't in place, then there's no chance that you can be successful. I'd say it a little differently, not to be that giving trust. Like you also say you haven't earned my trust, but really the big thing is to be able to give your trust to somebody. You know, like, I trust my team. But in order to do that, there's a kind of, there is this mutual respect that has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it's, but it is about trust and respect. I think the other thing I would say, as Brad has alluded to, we're, we're in a transition period, obviously, in terms of like what's happened with the pandemic. I think the day-to-day, -day, uh, the serendipity of being in, in the place with people in a creative en energy is really difficult to emulate in a virtual environment. You can certainly have uh, plenty of time on your own, but I feel like that's the, our challenge right now is how do you ignite that creativity again? Because it is just very, very difficult. That's not to put any, I think what everybody is doing now is working incredibly hard, but they're probably working hard at working instead of creating. And that's kind of, the trick. So that's, to me, that's the takeaway right now is like, how do you get that buzz back? To... But well, you it's have, a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, you've continued to, uh, you know, find success even, uh, you know, during these challenging times. And again, you know, congratulations for um, all your tremendous projects. Uh, you know, if I ever, you know, build something, <laughs> you know, grand, uh, I know who to, uh, uh, to contact and i would uh, uh, absolutely trust perkins eastman um, to do an excellent job uh, thank you for sharing all these 
you know, wonderful stories um, about teamwork. And uh, we hope you can come back to Rutgers, uh, you know, again sometime, build us buildings and, and you know, uh, teach us more about uh, all the, you know, fascinating things about architecture. So. Thank you. That was fantastic. Really, really fantastic. And it was interesting because um, the part about listening and don't, don't, you know, don't use your own filters. We heard the same thing from one of the athletic coaches at one of these seminars. So these, these themes do transcend the different disciplines. Um, and it's really interesting. I guess people are people. And yeah. that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And teamwork so, is teamwork. I mean, it's teamwork is teamwork. I mean, it's, exactly. I mean, I always, always, one of the things I insisted on with my daughters was uh, that, you know, starting in fourth grade, that they all had to play team sports. And so I coached 21 little girls teams, uh, three sports I wasn't very good at, but I was better than any fourth grade girl. And uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, uh, well, no, fourth grade, by the time they were eighth grade, it, it was a close run thing, but, uh, but, uh, but I coached, you know, soccer, basketball, and baseball, and uh, uh, and uh, because I wanted them to experience the, the lessons you learn in team sports, and uh, and and, uh, and they they all did, and they all continued to play team sports, and it was I think an important part of their life. Yeah, I mean, I would just add into that, like I, I my both my boys went through New York public schools. I didn't uh -huh. go to school here. Oh, I was really? just shocked, <laughs> shocked at the lack of sports, like team sports, because I actually think playing, as Brad says, playing on a team is like fundamental right. to learning how to operate in the rest of the world. And unfortunately, it's got to the point where if you're really good, you get to play on a team. Right. But you need the other guys because you need the really good. And I always remember in school, you know, the top soccer players were we were always broken up into teams and the teams were balanced out and mm -hmm. just taught you, you know what, that person may not be as good as you, but they have talents that you don't have. So if you can work together, you're better as a team. And I think that's a huge thing that should be put into edu back into education. Mm -hmm. so very important. Yeah, I mean, in fact, on a team, you don't, you have to respect the other members of your team but you don't have to like them but they're your teammates <laughs> right and you and you you want them to be successful in order to make you successful it's a very useful lesson to learn so if you only play tennis or you know you're a swimmer or something like that you don't necessarily learn that i mean the reality is that swim teams are do act like Team and tennis teams do too, but uh, mm -hmm. but it's not the same as when they're eleven of you out on the pitch or whatever. So, but it doesn't only have to be sports; it can be an orchestra. Like if, if they don't yeah. work together, is it, it's a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> Which is uh, you know, another a thing. Good thing to next. <laughs> in fact, I think that's the worst job in the world is sixth grade music teacher. Got to be the worst. Uh, no, no, I think being a traffic consultant. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have uh, uh, spent uh, your, you know, valuable time. Thank you again, Brad, Nick, and and, and Rachel for uh, all these words of wisdom. Yeah, it was and, really uh, terrific. Thank you so yeah. much. Have a, have a thank you, day. thank you for having yeah. us. Uh, yeah, uh, it was fun, and uh, and thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Happy holidays.